Chapter 18, the regulation of gene expression. The notes are fairly brief, so I want you to stick to the highlights of the notes. The book does contain a lot of detail, and I don't want you to get buried in the details. Now, the book begins with, the chapter begins with a, an example of a simple genetic on-off switch in bacteria known as the LAC operon. The purpose of the LAC operon is for the bacterium to make lactase, or sorry, lactose digesting enzyme when it needs to and not to make it when it doesn't need to. So, the gene is actually here. The operon is here. You have the actual gene for the lactose digesting enzymes here. There's an operator in the DNA right in front of it. There's the promoter region. You learned about the promoter region in the previous uh, chapter. That's where RNA polymerase finds and the, the DNA gene and begins transcription. But over here you have a regulatory gene. Now, when lactose is absent, the regulatory gene will transcribe and translate a repressor protein. It will bind to the operator, blocking the gene, shutting off the operon. If lactose is present, lactose itself will bind to the repressor and deactivate it so the operator is free and the operon is on. Now, eukaryotic gene expression is a little more complicated. Now, what we have here is the series of events that must take place between the chromatin structure itself and the production of the gene product. And every one of these involve checks and balances, uh, control measures. Now, of course, the reason why we have gene expression control is because you have the same genome in the cells of throughout your body, and but they all have different behaviors. They all have different looks. Your liver cells are different from your skin cells, from your uh, bone marrow cells. So different genes are active in different cells at different times. Now, the regulation of chromatin structure itself uh, there are ways that the chromatin can be tightly wound, that is preventing their transcription, and then there's ways that chromatin can be loosened up. In your notes, I mentioned a histone acetylation, which increases the opportunity for a gene to be transcribed, and DNA methylation, which decreases the opportunity for a gene to be transcribed. So those terms uh, deal with the opportunity for transcription. If it's too tightly wound up, you can't transcribe it. Now, over here, we have the regulation of transcription initiation. There are transcription factors that can make a gene more um, able to be transcribed, which of course is the making of messenger RNA. Now, in the next section, it discusses uh, RNA processing. Now, now in the uh, previous chapter, you learned that Introns, non-coding sequences, had to be spliced out from the messenger RNA to make a clean copy of the gene. Well, in addition to that, RNA processing can also lead to different versions of messenger RNA. Therefore, a gene can actually code for multiple proteins because an RNA can be processed in multiple ways. Now, after that, we have the control here. That is, how long does the RNA last? If it lasts longer, if it's allowed to last longer, you get more gene product. If it's degraded quickly, you get less gene product. So there's the control there. Then you have the control of translation itself. There are uh, substances that can block the initiation of translation. That is, block access to the ribosome. So there's the check and balance there. And then even after that, we have protein processing. Uh, in addition to making the polypeptide, the protein has to be processed into its quaternary structure. That's controlled. And also, uh, the protein itself can be uh, degraded. So these are all ways to control gene expression. Now, in addition to that, there are non-coding RNAs. Now, these non-coding RNAs are also used to control gene expression. Some of them can promote chromatin to become heterochromatin uh, to block transcription. Others can block specific messenger RNA molecules. Now, in the last section of the chapter, it discusses cancer. Uh, cancer was discussed in a previous chapter on cell division, and it's brought up again here. Uh, some genes involved. There are oncogenes, which are cancer genes. Uh, they're mutated versions of normal genes, and these normal genes are called proto-oncogenes. Many of them are, are these regulatory genes. When they get mutated, the cell loses regulation. 
There's also tumor suppressor genes which do exactly that, suppress tumor formation. Cancers usually involve multiple steps to develop, and it's referred to as the multi-step model of cancer formation. You can look at the diagram in your book that's concerning that. So most of the time, a cancer requires a series of uh, unfortunate molecular events before a full-blown cancer can be developed, whereas you know, pro, uh, oncogenes are just one of those steps. Now, some oncogenes are inherited. Some cancers have a hereditary predisposition. Not that they're strictly inherited. Most cancers are not strictly inherited. But because of the multi-step model, if somebody inherits an oncogene, it only puts that person one step uh, closer uh, in the multi-step. But it doesn't mean that that person will get cancer, nor does it mean that if a person did not inherit it, that they're free of cancer risk. Other factors are mentioned in your notes, such as uh, certain viruses that are linked to cancer, such as the HPV virus. So be sure to go through your notes, use the pictures in your textbook to help you with this, and stick to the highlights and you'll be fine.